Hey, how's it going? This video is going to be about personalized antidepressant augmentation. My name is Dr. Malsberg. I'm a psychiatrist, multimedia editor in chief at Carlat, and I sometimes make videos under the name Psychopharm. So, the idea behind personalized medicine is that it matches patients with treatments based on their unique symptoms and characteristics. And research can help guide us towards personalized approaches to antidepressant augmentation. I should point out that the info in this video is intended as a starting point for learning more about these options, and that's because these strategies often involve higher risk medications than our standard treatment, and they shouldn't just be thrown on without a much more careful consideration of the evidence and the risk. In this video, I'm going to give a super brief overview of some potential strategies. For the full article that goes into much better detail, check out the link in the description. And if you want a really helpful chart that reviews the information in this video, go to the carlatreport.com slash personalized augmentation. So let's get started. First, we're going to look at depression with suicidality. So there are three psychiatric medications with potential anti-suicide effects. Those are lithium, clozapine, and ketamine. For depression, we're going to be thinking more about lithium and ketamine. Lithium has better data in regards to long-term anti-suicide effects. Whereas with intranasal ketamine, we're thinking more about rapid action that has effect within a few hours. And IV ketamine may work just as well with effects seen even after a single dose. Next, let's consider depression with insomnia. So a good short-term option, hate to say it, benzodiazepines. It's super important to note that the studies here focus on short-term use, and we need to consider the risks of certain populations and weigh them against the risks of long-term use. Additionally, azopiclone is the only Z-hypnotic that's shown a similar antidepressant effect. And of course, we can consider the sedative antidepressants here. Here we're thinking mirtazapine and trazodone, and a little bit lower on the list, you can consider quetiapine. Next, let's talk about depression with mixed features. So this is a newer specifier in the DSM-5, and it's for patients who have depressed mood with at least three manic symptoms, but don't meet criteria for bipolar. Here we can consider the razodone, which has evidence as monotherapy, aripiprazole, which works in augmentation, and surprisingly bupropion, which might actually have the lowest risk of inducing manic symptoms. Our next consideration is winter depression or seasonal affective disorder. We know seasonal affective disorder affects up to 20% of people with major depressive disorder. Here, light therapy has a medium effect size, but it's important that we have patients doing it correctly. The light needs to be white spectrum, ideally 10,000 lux, used just after waking up, and 30 to 60 minutes daily. I think this is important to point out that it's important that patients do it correctly because it's not that intuitive, and there are a lot of cheaper options on Amazon that don't give the correct dose for light therapy. Our next consideration is vascular depression. So we know antidepressant efficacy is actually reduced in this condition. One strategy is using an antihypertensive that improves cerebral blood flow and has shown efficacy in vascular depression. Here I'm talking about nimodipine. Another option that might work in this population is repetitive TMS. All right, the next patient population we're gonna be talking about is depression with inflammation slash obesity. So here we're thinking about patients with a BMI over 30 or who have inflammation evidenced by a high CRP. Two augmentation strategies that stand out are L-methylfolate and bupropion, and omega-3 fatty acids may also be effective. Some augmentation options with unique benefits in patients with inflammation are N-acetylcysteine and minocycline. The next group is patients with depression with insulin resistance. So for patients with comorbid diabetes, they actually may benefit from augmentation with the anti-diabetic medication pioglitazone. Now I should mention, this should be done in consultation with the primary care physician. These meds come with side effects that we're not really that familiar with as psychiatrists, and we don't typically have a ton of experience with this medication. The next group is psychotic depression. So ECT is the gold standard, bringing over 90% of cases to remission. If meds are used, we usually augment with antipsychotics, and these are at doses that are higher than we typically use if we're using the antipsychotic for depression. The STOP-PD2 trial, suggests that we should continue the antipsychotic for six months to reduce the risk of relapse. And the last patient population is depression with fatigue. So here we can consider augmentation with modafinil or armodafinil, as these can be useful to target residual fatigue. So what's the Carlat verdict here? There are many types of depression and specific signs and symptoms can point the way toward a more personalized augmentation strategy. If you found this video helpful, 
definitely head on over to thecarlatreport.com and consider subscribing to the Carlat Psychiatry Report. Thanks for watching.